Hey everybody, my name is Chad Jennings and I wanted to say thank you very much for spending a little bit of time with us. I realize that we occupy that critical hour between the end of a long day and happy hour. So I won't say we're gonna go really fast, but I will say we're gonna be really interesting. So setting the bar high for our speakers. Um, our goal with the talk, we have three, and they are, we're gonna review the geospatial analytics suite inside of Google Cloud and what our investment theses and philosophies have been. Then we have, resulting from those investments, we have two really outstanding things to launch, which Emily is gonna take care of. And then we have not one, but two customers to come up and talk to you about their journey. So if we're successful with all three of these goals, what I'd like to leave you with is a feeling of both inspiration and reassurance that as you tackle these really gnarly questions around sustainability and climate change, that Google Cloud and our ecosystem of partners and the other experienced customers out there have got you covered. So that's what we're on about. Let's go ahead and get started. So to accomplish those three goals, we have four people, right? That's an over-constrained set, so we should be good. Um, Emily and I will run you through the product stuff, and then Jeremy and Martin will come up and talk about what their companies have done using the things that we're launching in like, you know, 10 minutes or as soon as I stop talking. Um, if you are watching this online, you can use this slide to navigate the video. For the rest of us here, we really don't need it because you all are stuck. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna set the stage just a little bit. And so all of us as data analytics minded folks have been totally consumed with one topic over the last year, and that is generative AI, right? It's everywhere, it's everywhere in this, cons in, in this conference. And to be honest, it's right. It came and it disrupted much of the work and much of our priorities for the first half of this year. However, that's for the analytics industry. If you search for Google Trends and you look at generative AI and all the related subtopics and climate change and all the related subtops, subtopics, you'll see that climate change is six to 10 times more prevalent than anything around generative AI. So while we are focused on Gen AI, large language models, how do we incorporate these effectively? How do we incorporate these responsibly? The rest of the world, like planet Earth and most of the people on it are concerned about other stuff. They're concerned about climate. And it's not unreasonable to see why, because it's getting hot. It's getting hotter. And I'm, I won't spend a lot of time motivating this here, but I did want to show you these two pieces of data. So the chart on the right, um, speakers right here, your left, I guess, um, shows the daily global air temperature since 1979 through to the first half of 2023. So the light gray lines are 1979 through 2021. The dark gray line is 2022, which was the hottest year on record up until, anyone? Up until probably 2023, right? We look like we're gonna take that record away. The article on the left side here or sorry, your uh, viewers right, um, you know, this isn't just a result of the natural stochasticity of, you know, of our planet, right? We are causing this change. And so as we are changing the world, businesses have to adapt to this new environment. And so businesses' priorities are changing in response. So governments are trying to figure out what new ESG reporting metrics are important and when are they due? And when do those metrics get businesses the proper considerations in their industries? Insurance companies are trying to figure out how to manage the new and higher magnification of hurricanes, right? The one coming to Florida right now, the one that just happened in LA, hurricanes in LA, really? Yeah. So insurance companies are having to grapple with this. Financial uh, institutions are trying to calculate the portfolio investment risk due to climate change. Public sector is trying to figure out how to manage road infrastructure, bridges, now that they're actually being submerged and, and drying out far more often than is used to happen. So really the question of where is sustainability and where is climate change driving need for new analytics? The answer is pretty much everywhere. And so if you have a platform, but your platform needs to have three specific qualities to answer this challenge. And those three qualities are, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, when you've got, so, sorry, let me back up a little bit, wrong slide. 
um, when you've got needs that are this prevalent and this omnipresent in the world, you start to get input and demands from two places. One is the very top of your funnel, right? Governments are setting up new, um, you know, governments are setting up new uh, reporting processes, and your customers are asking for new answers. And so, when you're getting squeezed from both the top and the bar, uh, both the top and the bottom, your entire company needs to respond. And if your entire company needs to respond, you can bet the board will want to respond. And if the board wants to respond, then you'd better have a good strategy. <laughs> so here you go. The strategy around sustainability really has two aspects to it. One of them, first and foremost, it's a data challenge, right? We've never been through this before, so we have to do research to figure out what we're up against, right? That's a data challenge. The second one is a cultural challenge. And when you put these two together, Google feels like it is very well positioned to have significant impact here because if you have the right data infrastructure, and if your data infrastructure has the right capabilities, then you can build the right culture to be collaborative and to be innovative and to be fast. So here are the three fundamental characteristics that your data infrastructure really needs. You need massive and ready-to-go geospatial data catalogs. You need immense storage capability and a lot of compute. And fortunately, the geospatial analytics suite that I'm going to talk about here is really built to highlight these three particular capabilities, as well as it's designed around the two major data types that geospatial analytics uses. So here's our analytics suite. The, um, the suite's built on four products, the pillars of primarily four products, BigQuery for vector analysis, Earth Engine for raster analysis, Vertex AI for access to all the fantastic APIs that they're producing, and then Google Maps platform for sharing and communication of the results that you generate using the other tools. And so let's dive in a little bit to the real, or the ones that we're focusing on the session today. So BigQuery Geospatial, actually a little bit of a nostalgia trip for me, I was actually uh, lucky enough to be the product manager who launched BigQuery Geospatial at this very conference, I think in this very room, six years ago. Since then, we've continued to invest to expand more functions and more ca capabilities inside of BigQuery's Geospatial so that it does more and more for you. So we were the first cloud at that time to have geospatial support, and obviously we continue to lead with our continued investment. The thing that that investment in, by implementing this in BigQuery, what that really gets you is data catalog, scalable storage, and this is what massive compute gets you. Things just go really fast, especially geospatial queries inside of BigQuery. So this is an example of a pretty significant geo join. And so this join is basically asked the question, how many land parcels in Texas have impervious surfaces? And so you're taking a 12 million row table, joining it again with a 12 million row table, the answer has 4 million rows. In Cloud SQL, this takes more than half a day. It's 12.1 seconds in BigQuery. We see this kind of stuff all the time. This is not unusual. I did not cherry pick this result. As a matter of fact, I think Jeremy is going Jeremy is gonna talk about some of his experience with this kind of performance boost. So that's what you get out of BigQuery's capability here. Let's dive in about as briefly to Earth Engine. Earth Engine's got these three primary pillars of differentiation. The first one, I mentioned before, the data catalog. So Earth Engine's data catalog is more than 70 petabytes big and more than 1,000 different geospatial data sets that are analytics ready. So for example, let's say you wanted to do an analysis over Landsat images over the last 40 years. That's including all of the relevant images is one line of code in Earth Engine. The Earth Engine team has built a pipeline that collects it from the satellite, does all of the pre-processing ready so that it's just ready to go in your analysis. <laughs> um, storage and computation, we'll talk about that one a little bit um, when Martin and Jeremy come up. The thing I wanted to also dive into is that Earth Engine has been in the market for non-commercial use for more than a decade. And over that time, they have built an outstanding and impressive user community. User community gets together in events like this, but specifically focused on Earth Engine. And there are 91,000 monthly active users in their community. That means if you're new to it, 
there is a big repository of willing helpers to help get you rolling. <clears throat> okay, the last one, the last pillar that I wanted to talk about is one that's actually growing here. A couple, this, has, this pillar of partners has grown remarkably in the last two years. And so if you wanna do some of this work, if you don't have a PhD in geospatial analytics, that's fine, you don't need it. But you might wanna have somebody with that qualification on speed dial, and that's what you can get from the partner network. So partners help with expert consulting. A number of our partners, uh, so Carto, Climate Engine, Aclima, Woza, several of them up here, have also built bespoke solutions on top of Earth Engine and BigQuery. And when they've, they've done that, customers like yourselves and the partners, sorry, just waiting for the truck to go by. Um, so customers and partners have asked us for a couple primary things over the last half decade of these pieces being out in the marketplace. Number one is more capabilities inside the products. And number two is better interoperability. <laughs> because when a, when a partner or a customer builds an application, Generally, it starts with whatever the problem definition is. That middle circle there is signifying tying several different pieces of the Google Cloud platform together to generate the solution, and then exposing the solution either through a map, Google, Cloud, uh, Google Maps platform, or through an API. But that process of tying several things together can be difficult, and then it can be difficult to maintain. So we heard that feedback, and our investments over the last couple years have been to really dive into interoperability between all of these pillars in addition to adding new capabilities. So, covered the suite, we covered the investment thesis. Now I get to hand it off for the really fun part where Emily gets to come up here and tell you what fruits those investments are bearing. So much, Chad. So I'm Emily Schechter. I'm a product manager on Google Earth Engine team. So Chad mentioned that one of the ways we think about building an industry-leading sustainability platform is by taking an integrated view across multiple geospatial platforms in GCP. So I'm really excited today to announce two new connectors that make using these tools together even easier. So first I'll talk about using BigQuery and Earth Engine together and what we've done to make that easier. So as Chad mentioned, Earth Engine and BigQuery share a common goal to make large-scale data processing accessible and as usable by as wide a range of people and applications. Earth Engine is fantastic for raster data processing, like imagery, whereas BigQuery is optimized for processing large tabular data sets and is already a critical part of many cloud data analytics workflows. But by using BigQuery and Earth Engine together, customers can accomplish tasks that are impossible on any other system. So to help people use these tools together, we built an easy to use function to export tables from Earth Engine to BigQuery. And we're thrilled to announce that this is now generally available to use, and there's a great blog post out on the cloud blog that describes how to use it. So the new connector is our first major step towards deeper interoperability between Earth Engine and BigQuery improving ease of use for workflows that use both services, enabling new analyses that combine raster and tabular data. So many of you may have tried to do this before, uh, and it involved a few steps. So by creating the data connectors between BigQuery and Earth Engine, we collapsed these steps into a single command. And since those middle steps were really data engineering, data wrangling, and not analysis, We've not only made this process easier, but we're also enabling you to spend more of your time on your valuable science and analysis. So for example, let's say you were doing some kind of crop yield prediction for agriculture. So your workflow might now look something like this. First, you use Earth Engine to calculate biomass from some satellite imagery for maybe entire continents. You bring that data over to BigQuery, you use a new connector, and you now can continue your analysis in BigQuery, for example, by doing a geospatial join with some other data that you already have in BigQuery, or by using something like BQML to create a model that predicts next year's crop yield. So we're really excited that this feature is now generally available, and 
We can't wait to see how you drive sustainability impact with it. So next, I'll talk about what we've been focusing on in terms of machine learning and interoperability with Earth Engine and Vertex AI. So while machine learning has been in use for remote sensing applications for decades, um, and it's been a core part of what people do in Earth Engine for a long time, thinking about that integrated view of geospatial analytics on GCP meant we really had a critical opportunity to bring together Earth observation imagery from Earth Engine with the easy ability to train and deploy deep learning models in Vertex AI. So Earth Engine previously had an integration with Cloud AI Platform for deep learning. And since Vertex AI is superseding Cloud AI Platform, we wanted to both integrate with the new platform and also solve a number of pain points that we heard about the old Earth Engine and Cloud AI Platform connector. So we're super excited to launch our new Vertex AI connector to public preview. So you can now take your pixels from Earth Engine and fire them into all types of models on Vertex. So the way this works is that you take imagery from Earth Engine out to cloud storage, you train your model on Vertex AI, host your model, and then do predictions with this new Earth Engine and Vertex connector. We have a technical blog post, we have documentation, and we have example notebooks that are all posted online for you to check out and get started. So we're really excited about both new ways that you can use geospatial data to unlock sustainability insights across our geospatial cloud products. And we have today two of our awesome customers to talk more about their experiences using these products to generate sustainability impact. So first we'll have Martine from Bayer Crop Science talking about how they've applied Earth Engine and BigQuery together to power R&D changes. Uh, which is especially important to understand how food production needs change as our climate changes. And then we'll have Jeremy from Clear Channel talking about using geospatial insights with AI to drive sustainability focus impact. So without further ado, here is Martine from Bayer Crop Science. Thank you, Emily. Um, hi, thanks everybody for taking the time. I know there's a lot of sessions and um, it, it might be a little bit hard to um, hear, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I'm Martin Mendes Costeville. I'm the v Vice President of Analytics and, and Data for uh, Vegetables R&D Crop Science. And what I want to do today is to show you uh, how we're using these products, these technologies that likely, as Chad was saying, are starting to be more connected across each other, right? Um, maybe as a, as a little bit of a background, when we talk about vegetables R&D in crop science, one of our core missions is around sustainability. Deliver digital solutions that influence sustainable products. Products meaning vegetables, right? Tomatoes, uh, peppers, cucumbers, and so on that we sell um, globally as well. So in order to do that, we obviously have a very robust uh, R&D pipeline that requires us to generate a lot of data, geospatial data in nature, most of it, um, and in a global nature as well. Um, I'm not intending to bore you to death with, you know, breeding concepts here, but you, you can think about it this way. So you have, if it's a tomato, you have the parents and you're going to breed them. You're going to come up with a new type of tomato and you're going to put that seed of a tomato in the hands of growers all over the world where you're going to test them, right? So are those uh, better than the, the seeds that we're selling now? Are they more sustainable, sustainable uh, environmentally friendly? Do they consume more or less water? Do they have better flavor, better shape, better color? You know, a million things that you're going to characterize and measure, right? And a lot of that is, is truly geospatial data and data that is collected once you put the seeds on the ground in trials, R&D trials all over the world, thousands of plots that are planted all over the world in about 20 different vegetable crops um, in an annual basis where you're going to collect more and more data and then hopefully use that data to uh, advance some of those products to the commercial phase, right? So one of the challenges we had um, in any big corporations, this is in a unique obeyer, is how fragmented our ecosystem is in terms of data. Uh, and when we started talking to Emily and Chad about using uh, Google Earth Engine and BigQuery together, this was one of our, our premises, right? Can we actually stop moving data around so much and 
Um, disclaimer, our crop science warehouse is built on BigQuery already. So that was a decision that Bayer Crop Science made a few years back where we are bringing all our data into a single warehouse built on top of BigQuery. So um, same as Chad, maybe I'll share a little bit of a trip into memory lane. For the last 15, 20 years, I've been um, chasing down the product team to understand how we can use Google Earth Engine more connected to Google Earth Engine, right? So how can we integrate this data now that we have the connector that Emily uh, presented? We've been using it already as part of this project, and that will advance our mission uh, greatly, right? We will stop basically moving data from all over the place. We have now that native integration between Google Earth Engine and BigQuery, and then we can use BigQuery ML and advanced analytics on top of both. Um, so in a way, you can think about the data catalog that uh, Chad and Emily presented, and we definitely like to leverage all the data sources, the data layers that are there already. Um, and in conjunction with um, uh, BigQuery and, and uh, Google Earth Engine, right? So we run all our models, train them, validate them, and then using the Google Earth Engine visualization options, we can enable our end users, breeders, members of our testing teams all over the world to see the result of these analytical models, right? So this isn't just you know, us talking about AI this or AI that or models or whatever. It's people actually seeing the insights coming out of those models. In this case, the, the map that you see there on that side, basically a representation of different environments within California. We have used basically all the environmental layers that are available in uh, Google Earth Engine, and we have brought all our data from BigQuery, and we have a split basically different environments according to how suitable they are for multiple different crops. Let's say tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and so on. Now, by using these platforms to chat point that are scalable, you can do that real time globally, right? So no, no longer you can do it in California, but you can do it across the globe on every single country where we are doing business, where we're testing these vegetable seeds. Um, and by doing so, you can imagine the, the advantages. It used to be very time consuming and very paper based, right? Now it's all digital. Um, on top of that, there's a, a lot of different features that we like about Google Earth Engine. I'll just mention one of them, which is data fusion capability. In the days of, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago, for maybe some of you that are uh, as old as me, you'll remember having to put all the data together and sort of grid it to some sort of common cell size and then creating all these derivatives of data, storing them, and then coming up with a, an output of it, right? So that, that's no longer needed because with this data fusion feature now, we can do real time on the flight greeting. We don't, we don't end up creating so much more data that nobody's gonna use. And this actually takes two lines of code in Google Earth Engine. It used to take you know, a data scientist hours and hours and hours of coding, and you end up creating a lot of data that was going to waste anyway. Now with a handful of lines of code, we can do this real time and have this output all, um, we like to use the Uber concept of uh, hexagon grids. So we like to use the H3 indices to, um, to grid all this data to a common, a common cell size. Now let's look at it, how that uh, impacts our business, right? Because it, this isn't just uh, R&D for the sake of uh, da doing data science, but we do want to end up impacting our business. So we, are, we have a very robust number one pipeline in, in the world when it comes to vegetables R&D. We had to create more products that growers would want, whether it's better tasting tomatoes or you know, more sustainable um, bell peppers because they use less water or they're more resistant to a particular pest and disease. You know, we have to keep advancing our pipeline, right? Putting all these things together, now we have the advantages of the data catalog, the processing, the modeling, and all this visualization. Now these uh, colors that you see on this map of Italy are the same concept of environmental clustering, as we call it, applied to a very different geography. Before it was California, now it's Italy. Now also you can look across countries, right? So you can see what tomatoes are better suited for Italy versus California. And maybe there's a particular cultivar or hybrid that applies to both, that can perform very well in both. That's not always the case, but just to give you an example. Now, and you can run it, like I said before, across every single country in the world very, very fast. Then you can influence your germoplasm design, right? So in the example, you have cauliflower, you know, some people like white cauliflower, yellow cauliflower, purple cauliflower, a smaller head, a bigger head. You can use all that data that is collected across all the trials that we're running 
and inform basically our pipeline. Advanced products that are not just more sustainable, but the consumers are seeking more, right? And ultimately, you can also use digital phenotyping. All of these technologies put together influence where we deploy sensors on the field, on our R&D trials, to now just not look at things and assess color, but now measure color with sensors on the ground, right? Whether it's a UAV or a sensor mounted on a, on a small robot inside a greenhouse or an open field trial, you can put it all together and you can mine all this data in ways that we could never dream of. I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna give now um, the word to Jeremy to, uh, so he can walk you through how they are implementing Google Earth engine and BigQuery. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Flynn. I'm the Senior Vice President of Data Products and Strategy at Clear Channel Outdoor, where I oversee audience and measurement solutions to run effective out-of-home advertising campaigns. So yes, you get to hear from a billboard guy at a cloud conference. At Clear Channel, I build audience solutions that match the right location with the right audiences to build the best performing out-of-home audience plans possible. You probably have seen our ads no matter how you got to this conference, whether you landed at SFO or Oakland or San Jose, or you drove up the 101 or outside the Moscone Center where you walked in today, we have thousands of advertising ad units in the city of San Francisco. And my hope for today is you, ever, you never not notice them after this session right now. Our industry, the out of home industry, is making deep commitments towards becoming more sustainable whether that is putting solar panels on top of our bus shelter ad units to reduce our reliance on the grid, or making the slow conversion to 100% digital billboard, we're deeply committed to reducing the time, effort, and materials that go into getting an out-of-home ad campaign live. And, and for all of you, that might mean the world becoming a little bit more like Minority Report or Blade Runner, but hopefully with a happier ending. Today, we're starting to see much more of an interest between brands promoting a sustainable message and the marketing and business outcomes they're looking to drive at the board level that Chad referenced earlier. CMOs are in those board meetings and they're being asked to promote the sustainable efforts of the brands that they work for. And I believe that effective advertising when done right through the power of influence could actually build a more sustainable world. This happens when you can drive sustainable consumer behavior and action over a long period of time. Um, I think a lot of you are about to remember this, but I'm a child of the 90s, and I really remember that Got Milk advertisement that I saw literally all over the place, on TV, on billboards, in my school library. And now as an adult, I, I've realized how powerful that simple message was in driving towards mass action, and how we need to start doing that today with respect to sustainability and climate action. So for advertising to be most effective, that means aligning the creative or advertising message with the right place, the right time, the right audience. And that right place normally is the right location. So an effective advertising strategy um, means that like, we have an ability to understand where to place the right ads at the moment of families deciding to make a more sustainable choice. We also do this for governments. As Chad mentioned earlier, it's hot. We actually partner with a lot of local governments, towns, municipalities, to actually promote sustainable messages and call to actions during times of natural disasters whether that be advising people to evacuate during floods or during upcoming heat waves, um, we are there and at the ready because we exist in the public square. On the other hand, with respect to consumer purchase, we actually work with brands to promote the sustainable products that they're bringing to market. And increasingly, we see a statistically significant increase in household purchases of these more sustainable products. That can mean meatless, uh, meatless uh, brands where we promote them right outside of the grocery stores where they could be purchased, or more sustainable automotive vehicles that we'd all love to see more of out on the roads today. At Clear Channel, we productize this geospatial data through our radar analytics suite. One, to modernize literally the oldest advertising medium in the world, and two, to make the world more sustainable. That might seem like a bitty, pretty bold claim from a billboard guy, but I'll tell you how we're doing with that data. One of the products in our suite is our Radar View product, which I'm about to demo. And we, this is an insights platform that is built on top of Google BigQuery, Google Vertex, and one of our, our strategic partners, Cardo, that 
that combines demographic data, behavioral data, audience location, location and proximity data um, to build the best performing out-of-home campaigns. And something that Chad also mentioned earlier, um, speed actually drives performance enablement, not just for the successful out-of-home campaigns that we're building, but to truly revolutionize the business practices or the workflows of our sales teams trying to sell those out-of-home ad campaigns. But a major problem with all of that data is that there are millions and millions of possible combinations and the options to build a plan then become limitless. And so that creates bottlenecks. It creates bottlenecks for people who we want to use our products to turn around media plans that we want to be selling to brands and advertisers. So that's where Google and Cardo come in. Using their technology, we're able to create even more self-service-based campaigns where we've introduced conversational artificial intelligence and natural language of processing to actually increase the speed and turnaround times of the types of media plans that we're trying to create. This combination of Google BigQuery with Vertex AI helps us produce actionable location intelligence and audience insights that ultimately helps us build and, and, and drive more successful out of ad campaigns. Let's uh, look at it in practice. So I'm gonna take a second to run the video. By adding Google BigQuery and Vertex running native within our radar view application, we can produce geospatial analytics where we can uh, first show all of our billboards on the map, and then we could actually add in an audience. In this case, we want to drive an audience uh, who might be in the market for buying uh, an electric vehicle. I see that out to the side. And then for today's purposes, we also can isolate that exact media plan in the city of San Francisco for hyper location based targeting to reach consumers in the city who might want to change out their car for a more sustainable brand model. And so as this runs, you could see the locations or the ad units that we could sell updating in real time. And finally, we're able to add in a final proximity filter, which is the proximity of our ad units to contextually relevant locations. In this case, electric charging stations that actually exist in the city of San Francisco. And here there are three major ones. And as we zoom in on the map in a minute, you'll actually start to see those locations pop up. So now we understand the ad units in context of the proximity of those vehicles, understanding the audience that are most likely to actually purchase the product that we're trying to advertise. Okay, that's the video. And I was taught how to flip to the next slide. Here we go. You saw how fast that works. And again, speed is a performance enabler. But by aligning the stack and having our radar view product sit on top of Cardo, sitting on top of Google Vertex AI, and sitting on top of Google BigQuery, we are processing hundreds of millions of records of data to surface the actionable audience insights to build the most performative out of home plan. And before we actually migrated to BigQuery, um, we were <laughs> working with multiple managed cloud service providers, and there was a lot of timeouts. Maps weren't rendering, and our sales team were not using data on their media campaigns. So we had weaker campaigns. After that, we actually saw a significant reduction in the processing time, like the example that we saw earlier. And now, with over 300 salespeople at Clear Channel who've been selling billboards longer than I've been alive across 30 markets, we're helping advertisers, large and small, locally, nationally, internationally, actually run higher, more performative campaigns. And hopefully, as those campaigns become more sustainable in nature, and those calls, whether they be calls to action or more sustainable products being brought to market like Martin is doing, we're helping to use geospatial data to help make the world a better place, even if it's for advertising. So now I'd like to invite Martin, uh, oh, Chad, Chad up first, and a few others. Got to leave it to the advertising guy to have the perfect tagline for his, uh, for his talk there. So we're going we're gonna to switch to the wrap up here, and then we'll have time. Looks like we'll have time for a couple of questions. Um, so I, wanted, I just wanted to uh, say that for Emily and me, right, from the product side, the Googlers who are involved in sustainability, either from the product management, engineering, go to market, sales teams, our jobs, we view our jobs to deliver exceedingly performant and exceedingly capable products that interoperate exceedingly well together. So that you all can go build, so that you all can go grapple with the sustainability and geospatial problems that you need to solve. 
what's really cool about that is that stuff that was impossible three, four years ago is now totally possible. So I encourage you all to go back and rethink some of the things that you've been, you know, have that you've had on the shelf that you haven't been able to do because the tooling will allow that to work now. Um, and so as you grapple with these problems, I'm really, really excited to see what solutions you go ahead uh, and develop. Um, and then speaking to a couple of solutions in particular. From the Earth Engine side, we're so excited that so many of these solutions, um, especially a couple of them up here, really demonstrate the incredible sustainability impact that customers are having with Earth Engine. Um, that's really driving change across these critical problems of climate change mitigation and climate resilience. All right, so we are pretty much at the end. Grab the app, let us know what you thought. Thank you very much.